We have a term that we use oftentimes. We were actually supposed to have a doubleheader today for baseball. We canceled them here in Virginia Beach. It's raining, it's cold, it's dreary, the, what you expect April to be around these parts. But there's a term we use in baseball, and I use it for my teams all the time, and the term is stop the bleeding. And uh, as, as morbid as that may sound, the whole purpose of that term is saying when you have an inning, don't let it be a big inning. Like, don't let it be a five-run inning. You can have a one-run inning, a two-run inning. And our teams over the years, we've won. It's not that we've won, we've won more games, but it's not that our team is just getting better. We're getting better at stopping the bleeding. And what I mean is it's, we're getting better at getting out of big innings. All right, that's typically what the term means. So those innings that can get away from you where you've got no outs and the base is loaded, you only give up one run or no runs, that's how our team has gotten better more so than just uh, having the bases loaded. Does it make sense? And so I always tell my team, hey guys, stop the bleeding. It's time to stop the bleeding. And so you'll hear our kids say it, hey, let's just stop the bleeding. And we don't have to say it anymore. It's just such a part of our culture, realizing that make routine plays routine, but just stop the bleeding. Don't let these big innings get ahead of us. Don't let these mistakes kind of uh, start rolling on top of each other. Have you ever had a, oh, I hope you have not, but if you've ever had a cut or if you've ever seen somebody with a cut and, and somebody say, run it underwater, the, the water does something incredible to an open wound. No matter how big your wound is, it could be something tiny or it could be a, a, a massive cut on your arm. If you run that wound underwater, it doesn't look as bad as it does if you let that blood run without water, right? Whenever you turn that water on, Whatever you're looking at looks a little less gory because there's no blood. The water is washing it off. But whenever you don't have that water, it gives the appearance of what's actually there. Does it make sense? So when you see what's actually there, you might get a tiny cut, but it's bleeding a lot, and you're thinking, my knees are getting weak. Right? And then you wash it off and, okay, it's not as bad as I thought. And you put a little Band-Aid on, you go about your business, and you tell nobody that you almost lost it over a cut that was the size of a penny right? There's something about washing the blood off that makes us feel like it's not as bad. If we're like, oh, it's not so bad. And then you stop the water and you're like, oh, it's bad. And there goes the knees again. You understand what I'm saying? It's this, it's this concept. But my question for you is what are you running water over in your life, in your spiritual life, particularly giving the appearance of okay, but it's not. You keep saying, well, I'm spending time with the Lord. I'm good with God, but it's not okay. Things aren't okay, and, and you wonder why you're in this cyclical life. It's because things aren't okay, and we're doing the same things over and over and over, and so this morning's title is It's Time to Stop the Bleeding. It's a very simple title, but I'm going to skip through 12 chapters of Exodus today, and you're thinking, man, we went through quick. Pastor Brandon must have just got sick of it. No, I didn't, but I want to help you understand the 12 chapters that we're going through. Last week, we talked about how we need the people around us to accomplish what God's put in us, and if you're going to endure the pressures, you need people around you. God's given us gifts, and we talked about the Jethro and Moses relationship, his father-in-law that spoke into his life, and Moses said, hey, he said, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to give to the, the, the tens, and I'm going to give the hundreds away, and I'm going to do the bigger, the bigger cases. And there's this whole leadership principle, but really it was about having people around you. And then we went on to talk about how we have to endure these pressures, but there's this, this concept that God puts something special in us, but to keep moving and to multiply, we've got to see things bigger than ourselves. And so we go through this, this book of Exodus where Moses is being told by God, come to mount the mountain of God. And he comes to the mountain of God, and people aren't allowed to go up there, but Moses goes up there, and he's trailed by Joshua. And when Moses gets to this mountain with this cloud cover, God starts to impart to him these amazing truths about who God is. He gives him the Ten Commandments. And he starts to tell them about how people need to be treated. He starts to give them some judicial rule for the people. And the whole reason he gives them these rules is to help them see, I want you to be holy, but you have to do these things. It's not saying do this and you're holy, but he's doing everything he can to consecrate humanity to be able to approach the king. It's the same grace that as Jesus came. God is saying, listen, I want social responsibility, and he covers that. He's talking about protection of property, talks about a promise of the Lord's presence, an angel that will go with him. He talks about offerings for the tabernacle, how the Ark of the Covenant is to be built, what's to be inside, the decorations, the color of thread. He goes into great detail to talk about the uniformity and, and, and the depth of what he wants his temple to look like and what he wants this moving tabernacle, excuse me, it's a better word than temple, this moving tabernacle, the first ever church plant by Moses, what it's supposed to look like as they travel through the desert. And he gives Moses this description and this DNA and these ideas and these, these things that is, this is how the social responsibility has to look. This is how these things have to be done. This is how the priests have to be dedicated. These are the details for the author. And this is how things need to be crafted. 
And he goes up on this mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. And that's the 12 chapters as you read through them from Exodus chapter 18. Really, it's 14 chapters because we're starting today on Exodus chapter 32. We didn't bypass those chapters because they didn't have any relevance that we bypass those chapters because the depth of what they are is important, but we landed on where we're at today because there's a word that God wants to give us that wants us to, to, to chew on because there's gonna be a process of having to regurgitate this thing. I know that sounds awful, but you're gonna have to chew and rechew this thing for a while. And so in Exodus chapter 32, Moses is on the mountain having this incredible experience with God. He is in the presence of God like no man has ever been. God is imparting to him. The Bible says that Moses had such a humility and such an understanding of God that God spoke to him in plain words. He didn't need to use any special wording. And so Moses was listening and he's writing this stuff down and he comes down the mountain with these 10 commandments and he's so excited. How many of y'all would love to come down the mountain with the 10 commandments for all of humanity? You wouldn't, trust me, you wouldn't, because the first thing, 40 days and 40 nights, and not trying to eat, y'all would be like, no, nah, I'll do it like a day, 12 hours. So in Exodus chapter 32, Moses is on the mountain, and the people are thinking, where is this guy? He went up to go get the word of God for the people, for the humanity. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, it says, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, Moses' brother. Y'all remember Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh together. God told Moses, Moses said, God, I can't talk. He said, well, take your brother with you. Let him be your voice. And so he said, they went down to Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. And so Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. Make us some gods who can lead us. You know what's interesting is whenever it says this fellow Moses, you can't fear God if you don't fear the people he's put in place in your life. This fellow, he had a staff that turned into a serpent. He parted the Red Sea with that staff. He threw wood into water to make it sweet instead of bitter. He used his staff to create water from a rock. This fellow, that's what they think of Moses. After 430 years of being slaves in Egypt, there was somebody with enough boldness to go to the Pharaoh and fight through 10 plagues to get you and your family into a new freedom you have never known, and you refer to him as this fellow? They don't fear God. They don't fear the men of God or the women of God. They don't fear a move of God. They don't fear the presence of God because it's not about God. And then it says, all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And then Aaron took the gold and melted it down and molded it. Aaron molded it. He didn't throw it into the fire and it came out as a calf. Aaron took the time and the craftsmanship skill set that God gave him to make a false God into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, when they saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then it says, Aaron saw how excited the people were, and so he built an altar in front of the calf. And then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. It says the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice the burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan reverie. It's interesting because they were impatient, but while God is imparting to their leader the direction and the purity and the passion and the movement, they're downstairs getting crazy because they just got tired of waiting. Where is this fellow? We make ourselves the gods who lead us. We're not making idols. Sure, those things are happening. We are in such a self-absorbed culture that schedules have to fit what we need. We determine what we watch when we watch it. My kids are about ready to have an uprising in my house if they have a thing come on called a commercial. They don't know what it is. They only know, get it when you want it. We make ourselves our gods. 
But something that we do that we continually do is we take what God gave us and then we take credit for it. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 35, when the people were leaving Egypt, it says the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed and they asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. And the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. The reason that they had the wealth was because God gave them favor with the Egyptians. The Egyptians worked for it. The Egyptians earned it, even though the slaves were most likely what earned it. They gave it to them and as they leave, now they think they possess the finances that they're sitting on so they can do with it what they want. Well, I'll pray about the things that I need to pray about. How about the house you currently live in? Well, like I could have done that on my own. I had somebody tell me the other day, he said, in the private sector, you'd make so much money, it'd be ridiculous because he knows me personally and he knows my greatness and he says all these things and and he says, but you, you know, you got your calling. And when he said that, it never even hit me. You know why? I've never thought about working in the private sector. I've thought about working for the Lord. I've thought about, I know I'm called to preach the gospel. I know I'm called to, to, to plow whatever God tells me to plow. I'm called to be a maverick and a pioneer. I'm called to go out in front. I'm called to bow down to my savior. I'm called to raise young men who is gonna walk in to be the men of God. I'm called to be a husband to my wife. I am called to walk this road. I've never thought about the fact that financially I can make a lot more. It has crossed my mind. <laughs> but I've never dabbled in it. Why? Because I know what God wants to do in my life will provide more in my life than anything I could ever earn. But we take credit for what we have. Well, my parents are rich. They're rich. You're not. How'd they get rich? You see what I'm saying? We like to take credit for the things that God has given us. But what they wanted was they said, we need something physical. We need something physical to replace what we can't see. So they're saying, our faith isn't what you think it is. If we just saw like a growth in my finances, if I start giving, then I would know God's actually with me. So until I see growth, I'm not gonna give anymore. Or if I actually saw all this person that I'm praying for actually come through my front door, then I would believe in God again. But the fact that I don't see that person come through my front door, I don't really believe in God. I'm like struggling. Or the fact that, you know, my husband and I and our kids, we're kind of struggling and, and God isn't really like, I'm sick of the struggle. I, I'm just tired of the struggle. Anybody tired of the struggle? Yeah, everybody can raise your hand because y'all are tired of the struggle. Stop lying to yourselves and to the people in this room and the people online. You're tired of the struggle. You say, not me, pastor. Now you're lying and you're tired of the struggle. You're human, which means you are jacked up. Well, not me, pastor. Okay, why don't we have you and your family come up here and let's just quiz y'all. Well, they're grown even better. My point is you need the grace of God, not idols and not a reputation that precedes you. Have you ever fasted, really fasted food? Because if you have, you know that you would trade in your car for a steak. And you know you would give up your entire family for a Frosty. And nobody is judging you for it. Because when you get to that place, it's just different, right? It's different. And you don't really care. Why? Because you shouldn't, because you're dying. And at that point, you don't care how much money is in the bank. You will be starving to death and a hamburger is more valuable to you than a bank account full of numbers. Why? Because you can't eat that. But yet spiritually, we're not feasting on the things God's given us that are nur nurturing our bodies and nutritious. We're going for the things that aren't and we're wondering why we're starving. And what God is trying to say to these people is Moses is downloading purity and a manual to be holy and with me. And you're down here impatient, ready to do your own thing. There is this entitlement. And it's interesting that the seemingly unmotivated, unmotivated people that the Israelites seem to be wanted to wake up early to start their party. And the Bible says people were, their, their enemies were amused by them. These people were crazy, rich, Throwing their parties out with their fake god that's a calf, which would have been a very normal thing in Egypt. Golden calf, that was an animal that would have been a very popular thing. These people are crazy. They were being, their enemies were laughing at them. Look at them. They're not powerful. Where's their god now? They didn't realize that their testimony was being broken down by their impatience and their submission and humility. They didn't realize that they're a good people maybe, but they were willing to get up early for a calf, something they thought they could see, but they weren't willing to be patient and wait on the Lord. They wanted it their way. They wanted it now. They knew the timing. It 
So why are we so mad? Like our life is really, our story is really more about struggle than it is about success. If we really talk about it, it's financial struggle, trying to get my business started. Like me and my wife are kind of always looking for direction. We feel like we're just in shambles. I've been praying for a long time. I don't know why God did this to me. I'm overwhelmed with the grief. I'm sick and tired of stuff not working. I'm tired of the same rigmarole. I'm tired of the cyclical life that I live. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm overwhelmed. I'm I'm financially tired. I thought I'd be further than I am. Anybody else understand what I'm trying to communicate to you this morning? Has anybody else been there where you're saying, I'm sick of it? We heard Pastor Isaiah this morning give us a very clean picture of a good heart saying, I am tired. I am exhausted from the fight. And this has been a week that has just tried me. And it is a week that is, and you don't even know, he, he had to Uber to church this morning because his car wouldn't start. The man is not just telling you stories. He is faithful, but he is telling you, I am tired. And what I'm trying to help you understand is that this is the normal part of humanity. But the reason that we're sitting where we're at is because we are angry with God because we feel like we are unjustly suffering. Well, so they're not me. You're prideful and you're angry with God. I have never met a person in my life that has not sat with some disdain for our creator because of where their life is at at some point. I'm mad. I'm sick and tired of it. That church, that pastor, they did it to me again. Sound familiar? I'm sick and tired of this, man. I'm sick and tired of just not having it. I'm sick and tired of trying to scrape by. I'm sick and tired of trying to figure this all out. I'm sick and tired of my home feeling like it's unwavering and like we're, we're ships being tossed back and forth. That's your spiritual instability, not God's. The fact that you don't know what's next is because you have been doing it on your own and you have not stopped to listen to the voice of God. You are not wavering because God is putting you to a test. You are wavering because you have not slowed down to listen to his voice. Because I will tell you this, I have had seasons that to the outsider looks like I am wavering, but inside I don't feel it. I feel like this. Why? Because I've heard God. And although it feels to other people like my life is this to me, I don't feel that. Because I know what God spoke to me and I have positioned myself to be in those moments. And unfortunately, I've been in the other side as well. And so what did these people do? They were frustrated, they were angry, they were overwhelmed. You say, well, Brandon, how do I know? Well, we feel like we've suffered enough or done enough for the church. We feel like it's someone else's turn to serve. We've served hard in the church and now people just need to step up. Like, I've served hard for years. Well, aren't you something? Aren't you glad Jesus didn't die and you have to re, re, re you know, kind of re-up every five years for your salvation. I've just given so much. The church has taken so much from me. Lord, forgive us. Oh, I've just, I've just, I've been there and I've like sweated and I've, I've been on the grind. You see, what happens is we get a self-righteousness that comes out of a bad perspective because our heart has turned sour. I've heard pastors say to me that have been retired in this church, oh, I've done that all my life. I don't really feel like doing that anymore. Part of me thinks, well, that's probably why you're retired and bitter. Because you didn't do it right. Because your heart sucks. Because those people I care about, they're my sheep, and I don't need you here. And not in a leadership role. And not speaking into their life. Because they need somebody that's drinking from a well that is fresh, not one that is muck and muddy. You see, what happens is a lot of people say, well, when you've been where I've been, I don't want to go where you've been. I want to go where God's taking me. And I hope that my heart stays connected to his and not on my own self-preservation. That's what happened to the Hebrews. They were worried about themselves. You ever wonder? I hear it all the time. Yeah, older people just get bitter. You don't see a lot of 20-year-olds that are bitter. You see a lot of 20-year-olds that think they're going to take over the world. Why? Because they haven't lived the life that older people have lived, right? They don't know the reality that you have to make a car payment on that Lamborghini you say you're gonna own. 20-year-olds are brilliant. This church was built by 20-year-olds. The t- People said, oh, young people won't pay the bills. They're lying. This church was built by 20-year-olds that believed in a move of God, got saved and baptized and have carried, Palms Church has been carried by 20 and 30-year-olds for the last 10 years. Our greatest givers, the percentage of age is 40 and under. And we have a lot of great givers that are above that. And I'm not using this as a metric. I'm trying to tell you, those stats have not been true for us. 
People that have been radically transformed have carried this church because there's something deeply connected to the heart of God for them, and it's personal. Does this make sense to you? God doesn't care about stats. What I'm trying to help you understand, the reason people get bitter is because you've lived so much life and you don't feel an end in sight, and so you just go into protective mode and opinionated mode, and you think, well, I just know you don't. You know the thing that makes my heart happy more than anything? When I see somebody that's over 60, that's joyful. Because you don't find them as much as you think. Why? Because we become closed off and we just know too much. I've lived a long life. Well, unfortunately, you probably asked a lot of questions that you didn't ask the right thing. Because if you're bitter, there's a core. There's a root that you have a responsibility to uproot. And we think, well, I just know a lot. No, you don't. You know your story, but not as much as you actually think about the story. Because the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? But there's no prerequisite for joy. There's no thing that the Bible gives us that happens before you're joyful. It's saying to be joyful, right? It's not like do this and then joy comes. Yeah, joy comes in the morning, but it's, it's saying if you want to be joyful, you have to make a decision that I'm going to be joyful and then God's going to do great things in my life, right? It's not like, well, these things add up, then you have joy. And so when you see people that are bitter, opinionated, they really have a hard way about them, they lack joy. Why? Because we're not starting with that. We're not starting with joy of the Lord. We're not starting with God. I fear you. I fear you, God. And these people, these Hebrews, walked through the Red Sea. They witnessed miracles that I would say many of you have never seen at that scale. They walked through a sea on dry ground. Now, I know we've had healings and miracles, and God still does it. I have seen that. But I'm saying you walk through a sea on dry ground, you have water provided in the desert, and you're still bitter? You're still opinionated. Why? Because it's got to start in your heart. It's got to start with the connection to God. And we're so, God gave me a picture of so many people at Palms that have gotten so deeply bitter and rooted and angry at your current situation. And the truth is, a lot of you won't hear this unless you have a move of God in your heart. You won't hear it because you're so mad. You're so frustrated. Living in an RV prior to COVID was laughable right? Why would you go do that? Sounds miserable. After, co- after COVID, everybody bought one. Then everybody traded them in. You see how different our world is? The world is just getting back to normal, but yet we let the ebbs and flows of humanity dictate our commitment to our creator. And what God was trying to say to them is, I've got something new. Don't live for God the way you've seen it. Live from the way he's calling you to, call, to, to live for him. You say, well, why is this so important? Because we get impatient, and when we get impatient, we do what we want, not what God wants. God will not bless your plans. We say, God, well, I need it done like this. this there's a deadline here. God, I need this job now. God, I need this relationship now. God, you said, God, why'd you bring me here for this? Well, what the Bible is teaching us is that impatience leads to sin. You're doing, the reason things seem like they're in chaos in your life is because they are. And you have made decisions that you said, well, God told me. And then what happens is it doesn't work out. And then you get mad at God because he told you. Guess what? He didn't tell you. Look in the mirror. He didn't speak it. You're saying, well, it just went, it just went to shambles. Well, either he didn't tell you or you didn't have the perseverance to fulfill what he asked you to do. But when God speaks, it's not a tumultuous affair that falls apart. He's in front of you. And how many times do we blame God for things? Well, God told me this. How do you know? Well, that's just the way I feel. You will see the fruit of God in the person that follows. I, and you have to have humility to look in the rearview mirror. I can tell you times that I have cost my family because I moved ahead of God. My wife and I moved into an apartment. We moved back into the area in 2011. We were at Evangel University. She was a resident director. I moved our family back because I was traveling. I was wanting to preach. I had this big vision that God had given me years before, and I knew this was the time. I moved us back. We lived in her parents' basement for a couple of months. We had only Caden at the time. 
And then we moved out of her parents' basement to an apartment 20 minutes away, super nice apartment. We didn't have the money for it, but God was gonna provide because he was faithful. And guess what? God is faithful and we had to get out of there because we couldn't pay the bill. And we went back to her parents' house and I got a phone call from a pastor that wanted me to plant a church and I said, no, I'm not gonna plant a church because God called me to be an evangelist and I'm an evangelist. And I was mad, God, you put me out here on an island. You called me to be an evangelist. You called me to do this ministry. And I'm out here on this island. I can't even afford a place for my wife. I can't afford a place for my kid. I'm a valet at this restaurant. I don't, I'm traveling when I can. Like, is this the best you got? I've got a college degree. You've put me out here and you've put me out here to fry. I can't believe you would do this to me, God. Who do you think you are? I was faithful. I was the one guy in all of history that was faithful that you screwed over. Yeah, y'all, y'all laugh because you know it's hitting you right in the stomach because you know it's true. I'm the only guy in the history. The word is not true. You are not faithful. You are not good because you screwed me over. You told me you were gonna be with me, but you're not here now. Where are you at? Where are you at? I don't see you. Where are you at, big dog? Nowhere to be found. That's what I thought. You're fake. You're a fraud. And nobody's gonna believe me because you're God. They call those atheists. And I was mad. I was so mad. But I heard God say to plant a church. And I didn't want to. My wife and I went to Lifehouse Church in Hagerstown, Maryland, August of 2012. And we started the process. And we were sitting there with the pastor. He stepped out for a minute to get pens for us to sign something. I looked at my wife. And it was a great deal. They were going to pay for us to, to be re church plant interns for a year and a half. They were going to send us down here, help us get support, pay me for a year and a half after the church launch. You couldn't ask for a better situation. This is really to be even at a place where the church planting world wasn't even this big in it. They were, they were just catching on. And my wife looks at me. I look at her. And she's smiling, thinking, man, it's so great to be right here where I know where God's called us. And I looked at her and I said, let's go. She said, what's, what's wrong with you? I said, let's get out of here. We can still bail out of this thing. She's like, have you lost your mind? I was like, no, I think we've lost our minds. Let's go. She's like, you, I, I don't want to do this. I said, I don't want to be here. I don't want to talk to the pastor. I don't want to be here. Why? Because I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm supposed to preach to millions on a stage in the middle of Zimbabwe. Like, this is not what God called me to do. And she says, Brandon, you better recognize. I said, oh, what? And I knew that God was saying, this is not what you want, but your heart is straying from me. You know, for years when I planted this church, I didn't really want a pastor and I made it very well known. I was waiting for people to not show up so we could close the doors and I could say, all right, God gave it a try, next. It took me years to surrender. I was willing to make a calf out of gold as soon as God's presence moved from me. I was willing to get out of here. And looking back now, I can tell you that I had a ministry for seven years that wasn't right. I got to see a lot of places, got to go a lot of places. It was a part of my calling, but it wasn't what God had. And I ran from him. We left Evangel University a year early. I can look back and see my mistakes that I made as a 28-year-old. I can look back and see mistakes that I've made in my life. But God reminded me last week, he said, Brandon, I brought you where I was taking you. This grace that was applied of, I'm still here. You're not set back. We have this mind, well, I'm set back years. I missed it. God doesn't work like that. He's a God of multiplication. He can do in a year what he meant to do in 10 if you would just let him do it. But impatience will lead to sin in your life. Exodus 24, 18 says it was 40 days and 40 nights, but we can't force God behind our plans. God, do what I need you to do. It's not the way it works. So Moses is on the mountain. In Exodus chapter 32, verse seven, it says, the Lord told Moses, so Moses doesn't know any of this is going on. There's a party, they're going crazy. They got the music going, they got the disco ball going. People are doing their thing, they're dancing around. And it says, the Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people who you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Wait, God, these are your people. And, but it says something that I think is something that all of us need to, we need to heed this and we need to chew on it, how quickly they have turned away. 
from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf. They have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are our gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Edom. They're giving credit to themselves for what God did. You're giving credit to yourself for your financial place, although God gave you that financial place. You're giving credit to yourself for the way your kids have been brought up, although the Holy Spirit is the reason those kids are where they're at in their life. You're giving credit to yourself for having done 40 years of ministry. It wasn't you who sustained for 40 years. It was God, and we are taking credit for things in our life that God has done, and my question to you is the state that you're in, the anger, the bitterness, the denial of being angry and bitter, the denial of being frustrated, how quickly in your life has it all fallen apart? How quickly has it happened? I said, man, it only took like a year. Yeah, it took like many years. How quickly did your marriage dissolve? How quickly did the infidelity kick in? How quickly has the financial picture changed in your life? How quickly has the bitterness set in? It's such a rage in your heart. Why is this? Because we are adulterers in so many ways. We are a consumer society that has become self-absorbed and we treat our coaches, our teachers, our pastors, and our friends as if they exist to serve us and we treat God the same. How quickly has it fallen apart? The reason that God was so angry is because he's so in love. It's really hard to watch my kids be frustrated moving something that all together they can't move. Knowing if dad walks out, I can do it without him. How much more do you think God sees? He's trying. We're so mad. We're so frustrated. We're so angry. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, Isaiah wrote a, a word from the Lord to Judah, trying to bring them back to God. And it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says, the Holy One of Israel, only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength, but you would have none of it. The people tried to meet their need for God by themselves. They didn't believe in God's leadership. They were unwilling to submit to him. They didn't want what he had. They said they did, but they wanted the good. They didn't want the relationship. They didn't really love God. They didn't realize that everything in their life that they had was him. And Moses and the Lord had a conversation. The Lord, Moses had to talk God out of killing him. He said, don't do it, Lord. Let me have at him. And I believe this conversation was more for Moses than for God. God needed him to own these people and to know that I want you to shepherd them the way I would love them, Moses. But you have to fight for them first. You know, when I first started pastoring this church, I wasn't fighting for you. I was praying that people would stop coming. And then it got to the point now where last night I wake up, I can't stop praying over you. My prayer wasn't that this message would be great, that I would deliver it the way God wanted. You know what my prayer was? I was up early this morning. My wife was yelling at me last night to go to bed. I just couldn't get comfortable. You know what my prayer was? It had nothing to do with how it was delivered and the word God gave me. It was already the word. It was that your heart to be prepared to hear what he's saying. It wasn't for me. I don't need this. I need this word, but I don't need to be prepared. I've been chewing on this all week, and it has been heavy. It's a correcting message. It is heavy. I get it, but it's not, you can look at it as, well, I'm doing something wrong, or you can look at it as God's trying to get me to a place where I can see and I can feel some freedom in my life. How many of us are identified by something that isn't God? A label, a color, a job. Moses, Aaron explains to Moses when Moses comes down the mountain, Moses slams, he body slams the Ten Commandments. He'll go back. He body slams the Ten Commandments. And when Moses comes down the mountain, Aaron explains to him, I just threw this, all the gold and it came out as a calf. Imagine that. Like God made a calf. I mean, where is it? Where's this going? Right? It's like having your child explain to you how the cookies are missing. I don't know. But Aaron's like, I don't know. I, he was coming. What happened? He, he can't. Yeah, threw it and boom, calf. Look at that thing. Beautiful, eh? <laughs> Moses had the Levites go back and forth through the camp. Mothers, brothers, kill all the sinners. The people who didn't want anything to do with it. They didn't want God. And it made them the priesthood because God said, they will do what I've asked of them. You got to get rid of the evil among you. God wasn't saying to do this now. He was saying, you have to set yourself apart if you're going to be my people. 
And I can't coincide with this. Exodus chapter 32, it says, the next day, Moses said to the people, you've committed a terrible sin, but I will go back up to the Lord on the mountain. Perhaps I will be able to obtain forgiveness for your sin. See, Moses understood something. He understood that repentance isn't about being right. It's about being remorseful. It wasn't that the people couldn't, get, couldn't be forgiven. It's that they didn't want to be forgiven. They, didn't have, they said they did, but their hearts were far from God. And I think the biggest trap for us, especially those, I want to speak to everybody in here who's claimed to be a Christian for any extended period of time. The biggest trap for us is thinking that we're still living righteous because we've known God and we know the word and we know how to get to him whenever we're not. You can know all those things and move away from righteousness. What's coming out of your mouth? What's coming out of your heart? What's being viewed and accepted in your home? There's a righteousness that God requires. And it's not a righteousness to get you saved. It's a righteousness to say, you have my heart. How many of you, your husband or wife would be okay with you dating around? Well, I just go on a date like she's cool with it. Really? No, it's infidelity. But yet we do it to God. We come to him, we need him to speak and we move away from him, we don't need him anymore. In your life, God has given you a lot of blessings. But God's blessings will become a burden when you take them back from under God's provision. The things he's given you in your life that seem overwhelming, when you start taking those things back, it's gonna feel really overwhelming. Why? Because you pulled them from his covering to yours. And Moses the book of Deuteronomy is full of a lot of the speeches that Moses gave the people. And Moses gave the people a speech in Deuteronomy chapter 10. It's referencing this. And it says in, in verse 12, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God. And live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. Look, the highest heavens and earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. Yet the Lord chose your ancestors as the objects of his love. And he chose you, their descendants above all other nations as evidence today. Therefore, change your heart and stop being stubborn. I met with a pastor this week. I was in another church. I was doing an event and I met with a pastor, and he's from Africa, and he pastored a very large church in Africa for a lot of years. He had gotten married and came over to America. He's got kids here, and his life has progressed. And I'd asked him, just out of curiosity, I would say, in your opinion, coming from Africa, and those of you who haven't had any experience with Africa, Africa is a, uh, he, he said it best. He, he was telling me that it's not that Africa has more spiritual warfare. It's just African, they, they pray. They pray uh, Friday nights from 9 at night until 9 in the morning all through the night, every week, in preparation for Sunday. He said, before every service, we pray for an hour, before the service takes place, before every service. And he was just talking about the way that people pray and the fear of God. And I said, so, so what would you say, I asked him, I said, so what would you say the difference, the thing that has caught you off guard the most about being in America as opposed to pastoring in Africa? What's the thing that has floored you or the thing that you think separates the things that people experience. Because he told me he, he, that, you know, that Africa has their own set of issues. He said these pastors have their own set of issues. Uh, he, he said, and they're on pedestals. And that's the exact words, but he said, he said I said, what is it the, what's the thing that, that surprised you the most? He said, the people in America, they do not fear God. He said, and I know this, I can't believe the way they talk to their pastors. So he says to me, he said, never in Africa would that be tolerated. He said, people do not fear God. He said, in Africa, they know that God can give and take life. God doesn't get, take life, but God has the power to remove things from people. And they pray for it. Why don't we fear him? 
think to fear something that way, you have to know them in that way. I don't think we know them in that way. A lot of us just don't know God in a way that we truly fear him like that. He said, people line up before church at different instruments on the stage. That's how they serve the kingdom. And he says, people will line up at different instruments to play for that service. To try to get there first so they get to play. Because that's the way they serve God. It's a completely different environment. He says, we, we don't pay people to play instruments in Africa. People run to the church to get there so they can play their instrument for God. You see, that's the exact opposite of entitlement. And I'm not trying to say we need to become the African church. We don't. We are the American church. But what happens to us is that we go back to our air conditioning and our heat and our nice homes and we feel like we are entitled to the benefits and the goodness of God instead of being broken for his calling in our life. And we're making the same idols. And for some of us, you just don't care. You just don't care. You, you're hearing it. You're like, yeah, man, I kind of. Some of you just don't agree. Why? Because you don't submit to any authority. So you're not going to hear what I'm saying. You don't submit to authority in your life. You don't submit to me and my wife. You don't submit to the authority of this church. You come here because it's cool and it's a great place. You have community, but you don't submit to us. You don't submit to what we're actually saying. You hear what I'm saying. You think pastor put together a good message. I'm sitting here trying to tell you, God gave me this word for us. But if you don't hear it, it doesn't matter. Why? Because you continually don't submit to authority. That's why you can't keep jobs. That's why you are constantly trying to figure out your life's work because you don't submit. You don't fear God. You don't fear authority. And so you're constantly in movement. Like, well, I just don't agree. Of course you don't. This is my point. You don't submit to authority. You don't agree with any authority. Unless they say, what you're thinking, you don't agree. You see, authority isn't when you hear something and you agree. Authority is when you hear something you don't agree with but submit to it. I know some of y'all's stories and that's not why I'm preaching this. I'm preaching this because I can't get past this until God, God's taking us somewhere and this has to be said first. It's that clear. God wants to do something in your life, but you have got to humble yourself at the foot of your savior. And that doesn't mean God, whatever you want. No, it means you praise him with your mouth and the joy will follow your praise. We are angry with God because we are unjustly suffering. And the impatience in our life will lead to sin. So what do we do? We do what the scripture says. The first thing we do is we change our hearts. Change your heart. The Bible doesn't say God will change your heart. It says you change your heart. What does that mean? You look yourself in the mirror and you change the way you think about God. You change the way you think about things around you. What's the second thing you do? You stop being stubborn. Stop being stubborn. See, I feel like I'm getting lectured. You should. That's what the Bible says. You feel like you're being lectured if you're not willing to heed what God is speaking to us. Change your hearts. Stop being stubborn and you'll get out of the cyclical movement, the same thing. Well, now it's exciting because it's something new. But do you ever get sick of something new all the time? You ever just want to do something great over a long period of time? Stop being stubborn. But it's going to start at this place called repentance. Start this place saying, God, I submit. I surrender to you, God. I surrender to your voice in my life. I surrender to what it is you're saying. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This verse you have heard in this church a lot. You will hear it all the time because this is a life verse for me because I need to hear it. I'm a passionate guy. God will, I have always said, God will never have to speed me up, but he will have to slow me down. And I said that my entire 40 years on this earth until two months ago. When God told us we were launching Oakland, Maryland in under three months to rehab a building, to have to build a team and to be doing those things. But God said, no, I've got it. And he does have it. Movement that he's doing in the church internally, that he is pushing me to a place that I am not comfortable, which is not something you hear me say very often. He is pushing me faster, further, and I do not like it. It's the thing I've always prayed for, but I personally would rather him not do it this way. And in my personal life, 
in my and Casey's reach in the community. I don't like how fast he's pushing me and how far, but I'm not getting to choose these things. I am saying, God, I surrender to you. In Luke chapter nine, verse 23, Jesus says to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, if you wanna be a man of God, a woman of God, if you wanna really know what it is God is doing, if you really wanna be my follower, then you will take up your cross. But before you do that famous verse we always talk about, before you take up your cross, what do you have to do? Give up your own way. Give up your own way. I'll tell you something that breaks my heart. When I know somebody really well, and they go through seasons of hard and it turns into bitter and then things start coming out of their mouth where you realize, I don't think, they think they're talking to God. I don't think they are. I think they're talking to God but not listening to him in return. Because when they, the bitterness coming out of them is dark. You ever had people like that? And it breaks my heart because you see their spirit going gangrene. And it's hard to watch because you feel like you're Moses on the mountain and you had friends like this and you know down below, they just don't get it. Because I've been there. I have mentors in my life where I ask all the time, I need you to help me. Where do you see me at? This won't stop until you stop it. It won't stop until you stop it. Why are you so mad? Why is your heart so hurt? Why is God being blamed for where you're at in life? Why is God at fault for your struggle? Why are you so frustrated? If you believe he is the, the healer and the maker and the creator, why are you so mad at him? And why are we making false gods, things that we can see to make us feel get better for the moment? For some of us, it may seem crazy, but you get that feeling, you start buying stuff online because it just makes you feel a little better. For some of you, you get that feeling and you start taking it out on your kids because it just makes you feel like you're in control. For some of you, you get that feeling, you start taking on your wife, feels like you're a little bit in control. And I'm saying, why are we so mad? Stop the bleeding. It's time to stop the bleeding. Don't let this inning get too big where you're letting 50 runs score. Stop the bleeding. Talk to a mentor in this church. Talk to a life group leader. Talk to a pastor. You say, I'm struggling. I don't know what it is, but my life, I am struggling. I'm so mad. For some of you, you come up here and you have joy and you celebrate and you should, but there is something in you that is so frustrated and angry and God is saying, let me heal it. Let me do it. Let me fix the broken and change your life. I believe God wants to do it in your life today. Let me pray over you. Lord, I just pray for your people. God, I ask you today that this word wouldn't fall on hard hearts or, or coarse disdain, but Father, it would be accepted and received and go into the deepest part of our hearts, the deepest part of our being. God, that it would be something that we could apply and know that, Father, these things are out of love. These things are out of a place where you're beckoning for our attention. You're beckoning for us to see you and to be given a chance to show you who you are and not who we want you to be. God, that we would get away from the excuses and we would get away from the entitlement and we get away from the places that we feel that we deserve something from you, that we have earned something that we haven't been given, that we, we should have better. God, that you have cost us something, that your church has cost us something, that being a servant of the Most High has cost us something. I pray right now in Jesus' name that we would see the only reason we have anything is because of you. That God, you are the provider. We have not earned it. You have given it. And all we have is yours. And we celebrate today, God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but saying today, I'm just ready. I know that I've held back. I know that I've pushed against this. I want you to say a prayer. I want you to repeat it with those saying it for the first time. Just say, dear Jesus, I surrender. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. 
and that he is the son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand with me this morning? I could fill time and time and time with stories about my life. I could fill time and time and time about things that I've done that are pretty stupid. I can fill time and time and time about things that I've done that have been good. And I can fill time and time and time about things that are in progress and in process. Y'all go ahead and come on. Didn't know if y'all were waiting for me or just waiting for the cue. I was like, that was the cue. Stand up, let's go. Get me off the stage, man. Come on. And my wife and I moved down here in 2014. Caden was three and Rylan was one. And uh, the way that church planning taught us was that you got to have a building months out because you got to outfit it. You got to build it out. You've got to, it was church in a box. I mean, all these new organizations and corporations were coming in. It was a, this big kind of push for this church planting movement at the time. And um, I remember it was August of 2014 and we were launching in September and we didn't have a building. And so this was unheard of. People were thinking, you, you got you to gotta launch a church in five weeks. I was like, I get it, but I can't force my hand on this. I mean, I had looked at buildings all over the city. I've gotten no after no. There wasn't even an option for a yes. And so one night I was going to bed and I, God gave me a picture of a school. And I looked it up online and it was Great Neck Middle School. And I was like, oh, I didn't know they had college campuses that have the name of middle schools on them. Are you kidding me? So that night before I went to bed, I wrote the principal, Dr. Soltner, and he wrote back and he said, come in this, the next day and, and you know, look at the school, tell us what you think. And we walked into the school and I knew right when I walked in, it was the right place. Anybody ever remember, you know, Sam, you know, Sam Johnson, uh, the best, the best uh, uh, engineer you'll ever have of everything, right? He was our school janitor. He was there an hour before and was one of the last, he was the last one to leave. Sam was awesome. Make some noise for Sam. Y'all know the OG. Sam, if you're watching, I love you, man. And we met at Great Neck Middle School for four years. And in 2018, God said, I'm gonna launch three campuses over the next three years. I didn't know that it would be a COVID, but I knew that we were gonna move. And so we, we prayed and the Damn Neck campus over at Strawbridge Movie Theater opened up. And it was great. Things were going great in 2018. And then we, 2019 comes around and we had moved our main campus from Great Neck Middle School to Cox High School for space and be able to shoot different video and things like that. We were only there a couple of months and then um, 2000, or excuse me, 2019 we launched, 2020 came around and God spoke to us and he said, hey, I want you to close down the movie theater campus. It was on a, uh, like a, a Tuesday. I said, okay, why? He said, it's not a bad thing, just trust me. And of those of you on the leadership team at the time, remember we came into that meeting and I said, hey guys, I said, this is going to sound crazy, but God said to close down the campus over at Damn Neck in the movie theater. It's going great, I know, but it's just the right thing to do. And everybody starts cheering. So I was like, well, I guess it wasn't going as good as I thought. But you could just sense that God was doing something. We knew that he was in it. Well, that Friday, COVID hit, and they shut the world down. And a lot of churches got into some debt because there was contracts and everything else. Well, God had gone before us. The school system said, hey, we're not expecting anything, but we got out of all of our contracts as a church with every entity that we owed. And so we came into COVID having no overhead. God shut it down just in time. Now, prior to this, if you go back into 2014, when we launched the church, I preached at a men's event right here in Virginia Beach. It's where I met Bishop Courtney McBath, who's been a spiritual father to me. And at the event, one of the, a guy came up to me who was the main speaker. He said, hey, man, I got a word for your church. God is going to, your tent pegs are going to be stretched out all over this city. And he's going to give you everything underneath of it. Little did I know that that would mean we were going to meet in a movie theater in Strawbridge. Little did I know at the time we were going to be at Great Neck High School or Great Neck Middle School at Cox High School. Little did I know that we were going to end up online for a full year, being able to reach thousands of people every week that didn't have the access to online services. But we had the Resi, the uh, online solution that we used over when we launched our campus. God had prepared that. So when we went online, we, we couldn't get the equipment. They were back ordered because every church was trying to get it. Well, we already had it. 
And so we were able to go online live for a full year, able to reach thousands of people every week. That, and then they went back to their communities and into their churches. We were able to be a church during the hardest time in our history to speak life into people. Little did I know that was another campus that God was opening up with our online campus. So in 2021, before that, the fall of 2020, God spoke to me and I went to Open Door and I took a left and when I walked into that building, God said, this is what I have. It was that clear. I said, well, that's great. This looks awesome. And then I walked back to a corner of the building and I knew that that's where we were supposed to meet. And so we started a construction project at Open Door in 2021. And we were there for three or four days and then they kicked us out because we tore too much stuff apart. It was a handshake agreement. I was like, okay, so we left. Didn't know what we were gonna do. We were still online, but we knew God had spoken to us. And I was just at peace. I said, I know God spoke to us about this place. 10 days later, the pastor calls me back. She says, Brandon, I can't do anything. I, I was driving yesterday. I didn't even know where I ended up. The Holy Spirit's been so heavy on me. He told me, you have to be here. You have to come back and finish this and your church has to meet here. I said, okay, we're coming back. And 10 days later, we went back. We finished our build out. And for two years, we met an open door and our church grew uh, a lot. We were outside. We had tents set up outside that were filled with people. Our, our room got to standing room only, multiple services. And we knew that in 2021, I told our team, I said, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know before we get to the next venue, we're going back into a high school. Do you remember me telling you all that? And Corey was like, oh, geez. I said, yeah, man, I know. But he said, we'll do it, whatever it takes. And so I said, we're going back to the high school. And so at the end of 2021, we had gotten word that we were going to have to move out because that building was going under construction. So we knew we had already been to be prepared for it. And so in 2021, we started to prepare to build it. And we didn't know what high school we were going into. We didn't know where we were going to be. Somebody called me and said, have you thought about Green Run? I said, I have not. But the minute they said it, I said, that's where we're supposed to be. I came up here. We looked at the school. I said, this is the right spot. And those of you who are at Cox High School know this looks eerily how much like Cox High School looks like. And I told my wife earlier this year, I said, I really know that God said two years in a high school, we weren't gonna be there longer than that, but I said, I just, I'm ready to go. Everybody's always said, well, what about building space? And I said, you know, I planted this church. I could never have done what God did here if I did it with my own power. I never could have had the financial money that we've had to do these different things. I mean, it cost us $120,000 just to move into this school. I said, I never could have done that. Wes was on the elder team. Elvin's been on the elder team. They've been working with finances for years for us. There's no way this, none of this could have ever happened. With Wes was on our launch team. You know God was good. Y'all don't know, this is the most loyal guy you'll ever meet. You say, I need you to ride. He said, how many years are we gonna serve afterwards? I said, don't know. It's a true friend though. But I'm saying you look around now and a lot of you have been here for so long. And I said, God, I don't ever want to become about a place. I want to become about what you're doing. And God told me during COVID, from here on out, you're an online church with a physical location. He gave me a picture of a studio, like an NBC studio where you're shooting live all over the world. And recently God gave us a property in Oakland, Maryland. And people said to me, listen, I'm so excited, but my parents are asking, how do you, you guys don't even have a property. And yet you're opening something up in another state. I said, I know it's weird. I said, God didn't give us property in Virginia Beach, but he gave us land with our name on it in Oakland, Maryland. We own buildings. We own property in other states. I said, I don't get it either, but God said, you stay faithful to what I'm asking you to do, Brandon. And I will put temples in places you could never imagine. I will build churches that you will broadcast from and that people will come to and they will see and they will be in the form of cell phones in their hand. I will build tabernacles on iPads. I will build my kingdom if you're just faithful. I'm not asking you to, you can't ask questions, but don't question me, Brandon. Walk and I will take you to a place. I will take Palms Church to a place that few will see. I need obedience that doesn't make sense. I need people that are willing to count a cost. I need people that are saying, God, it doesn't make sense, but I surrender in the name of a mighty, holy, powerful redeemer. I need you. He said, you give me everything in your hand and I will multiply it. I want it all, Brandon. I want everything. And y'all don't know this? This fall, our church had zero money left. Zero. Zero. 
Zero. Brandon, please raise your hand and let them know this is true. Zero. When I say zero, I'm saying we had missed payroll. It's missed. It wasn't because we did money bad. I said, God, we have no money and there's no rhyme or reason. We had two months this summer. For whatever reason, everybody stopped giving. I'm talking like 300%. I said, God, you're wanting me to launch a campus in a state that we don't even have connection to. We have no money. In the middle of having nothing, God said, I need you to launch this church. And I said, you've lost your mind. But we said, yes. We said, yes. And God spoke heavily to our staff and to you. And we all gave a seed that we could plant in Oakland, Maryland that would turn into that campus. 60,000, more than $65,000 in one day to launch a campus. And you didn't even know we had no money here. When we took that offering, we had nothing. But we trusted God because he said, I brought you to this place so you will know that I am your multiplier. He didn't even give us anything to do it with. So we launched that campus. And God keeps speaking to us. Give it to me and I will multiply it. But what he said is Palms Church will experience things few will ever experience if you walk in faith as people that don't need explanation. I heard the rumblings. Oh, you ain't got no building, man. We're meeting in high school. We got like people over in Oakland, Maryland got a building and they got like nice stuff. In the midst of all of this, God gives us a property in another state. He's a funny fella. Finances go up. Organizations start giving to that Oakland campus. Other churches have given to that campus. Our bank account got padded by other things. And then Green Run comes to us and they said, hey, we have some bad news. Two weeks after I told my wife, I'm ready to go. I know it's time. They said, we're going under construction in June. And so we'd love to have you come back in the fall, but we're going to be closed this summer. So we're going to rent a tent and have it on the, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> y'all were ready. That's why you're so great. How many of y'all were ready to go tent camp meeting this summer? Y'all were ready. That's what you built. And listen, we're coming up on our 10 years this year. And if somebody would have told me you're going to be mobile for 10 years, I would have said, that's another reason I'm not planting a church. 10 years, y'all have come in. Every guest speaker I have says, man, that place, you people just work. Y'all just work hard. So we don't know any different. We don't know what we're not supposed to be able to do. And so I'm standing here today. They said, we don't have uh, after June. And so I talked to the team. I said, guys, I really feel like the Lord is stirring. He's given us a home. He's going to give us a building. So we just need to pray. I said, but I'll tell you what he told me. I want a studio. I want something that feels gritty. I want something that is going to be an absolute hub of power and intensity in the middle of this city. And on Thursday, we just signed a five-year lease on a building right on Virginia Beach Boulevard near Town Center. Come on, somebody. Yeah! They said, you don't want like a two or three-year lease? I said, no. I said, I want a five-year lease. They said, are you sure? I said, yes. They said, why? I said, because we got properties in other states that we're already looking at churches that have already, they want us to take properties. I said, I want a place where I know I'm going to have Christmas Eve for the next five years. That was exactly what I told him. I don't want to start thinking about Christmas Eve in August about where we're going to have it. 
I said, I really feel like God is saying right here, and this is personal for me because my oldest is 13. So when he's 18 and leaving my home, I absolutely believe this church will be in a place we'll look back and say, only God. And so our first Sunday in our new venue will be June the 2nd. We'll be ready to go. And so I'm telling you this because now this is what I need from you. Put on your work boots because we got some work to do. We got to demo the place, get it ready. Dream team, this is where we need you to dream. The second thing is this. I was about to sign the lease. Pastor Corey was there walking through the building and I didn't feel hesitancy, but I said, Lord, this is beyond me. And he said, if it wasn't, it wouldn't be me. I said, I don't think we can pay for this. He said, if you could, you wouldn't need me. He said, trust the people of Palms Church. The church is gonna continue to grow. The people who aren't giving are gonna give, and the people who are giving now are gonna give in more faith. It was that clear. And I talked to Corey as soon as we got done signing it. And I said, he said, man, this is gonna be awesome. He said, how you feel? I said, I'm terrified. He said, why? Because my flesh says, what you just do? My spirit says, you have to. And so what I'm trying to help you understand is that this is a hub where we're gonna be able to broadcast all over the world for the next five years. It's intentionally, it's not massive. It was intentional the way we have walked into this building and what we wanna do with it. Parking's gonna be fun. We're gonna be able to run around and see each other. We have, the guys are hitting me up for golf carts. We're gonna have a great time, guys. We're about ready to throw down in Virginia Beach in a way we've never had. We're gonna have a celebration. We are home. I can't tell you how excited I am, but what I'm gonna ask you to do this morning, we're gonna sing and we're gonna talk about how great our God is, but if you could just lift your hands to the heavens and could we take a minute and just thank God that we might have been wandering. We were never wandering, although it may have felt like we were, that we, we have gone from place to place and thing to thing, but God is faithful. Lord, I just thank you so much for your faithfulness. I thank you that today we can be corrected and felt loved. We can be corrected and know that Christ is our savior. We can feel the stirring and the unwavering, but know that God, you are designing and leading us and putting us into a place that only you can. God, I ask today that each and every heart would be renewed, each and every heart would be stirred, knowing that, God, you are with them and that you love them and that your hand is on them. Holy Spirit, I ask right now in the name of a mighty God that we would just surrender and submit, that we would be contrite in our spirits, submissive to your feet, knowing that you are good and that you are God. We fully surrender as a people. We repent. God is Palms Church. We stand in a day and say we will not be moved. We are planted in this city. We are planted in the communities. And I pray that we will be planted on every iPad, cell phone, and computer. Project us to the world and we will preach your word, God. We stand in the day submissive and ask that you would help us to remain obedient in Jesus' name. Come on, tell him how great he is. Yeah. Tell him your name is so great, God. You're a mighty God.
Hey, thanks so much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss any new content or videos. We're here live every week. We'll see you soon.